Welcome everybody, thank you for being here. It's a little bit colder than we planned, uh, but I appreciate it. And we'll try to keep things moving so no one freezes. Uh, I'd like to begin by acknowledging that the University of Virginia, the land where we learn and work, is the ancestral homeland and traditional territory of the Monacan Indian Nation. We pay respect to their elders and knowledge keepers as we do to the enslaved laborers and free black laborers who built UVA. May our actions serve their descendants. I'm John Unsworth, university librarian, dean of libraries and professor of English. And today I'm very pleased to welcome President Ryan, Senator Deeds, Vice Rector Brown, and other Board of Visitors members, members of the University and Charlotte, Charlottesville communities, and many members of the Shannon family, and everyone else to the grand opening of the Edgar Shannon Library at the University of Virginia. With the opening of the Rotunda in 1826, Thomas Jefferson put a library at the center of the Academical Village. The Rotunda served that purpose for roughly the first century of the university's existence until Alderman Library opened in 1938. A research library for its day with high density print storage, enclosed stacks, and a nifty book conveyor belt built to deliver requested materials to the circulation desk. Since then, the university has proliferated its libraries, adding ones devoted to science, music, fine arts, rare books and manuscripts, not to mention law, business, and health sciences. But this building remains the university's main library, and today it holds the humanities and social science collections. It is fitting, therefore, that it be named after Edgar Shannon, the fourth president of this university and a man who was also a faculty member in the English department, a scholar of Victorian literature, and an editor of Tennyson's Letters. The building you see behind me had been planned and replanned over a 20-year period before I arrived in 2016. I want to thank former university librarian Karen Wittenborg and others at the university who kept the project percolating through the capital projects list until it finally popped to the top of the stack. Plans for the renovation have now, that we have now accomplished were approved by the Board of Visitors in September of 2018, and President Ryan then, in the first year of his presidency, pitched the project enthusiastically to the Commonwealth's legislature, which ultimately provided a total of $143 million in funding for the project. Thank you, Senator Deeds, for your support and that of your colleagues. Likewise, the support of private donations, both large and small, was also crucial. Thank you to Marjorie Harrison Webb and Marjorie Webb Childress, who co-chair our fundraising campaign and gave generously themselves. And thank you to all the members of the campaign committee here today. It's important to note that no tuition dollars were spent on this project. It was entirely funded by the state and through private donations. Today, the library's almost reached its $100 million capital campaign goal. Shannon Library represents an unusual combination of renovation and new construction, seamlessly integrated in a structure that's far stronger, safer, and more sustainable than what it replaced. Thank you to all those who contributed to this massive undertaking. Eric Lasher, Michelle Silvetti-Smith, William Kinane from HBR Architects in Chicago, Clark Nexon of Richmond and the Office of the Architect here at the University, the Office of the Provost. This team worked with library leadership to create an amazing vision for a modern book lover's library. Thank you also to Skanska and UVA Facilities Management and all the subcontractors and workers at every level who took that vision and turned it into the remarkable building we see here today. The amount of labor, planning, and coordination embodied in this structure is hard to sum up but easy to see. And finally, I'd like to thank all those library staff who labored over the last four years to serve the university during the renovation diaspora and the pandemic with which it coincided, and who then jumped to the front lines in December and in a few short weeks had the building open to the public. You are an inspiration. We'll hear a good deal more about Edgar Shannon over the course of our program this afternoon. For now, I'll just thank the Naming and Memorials Committee and observe that by putting his name on this building, the university has chosen to honor a leader who embodied Aristotle's five intellectual virtues, craftsmanship, prudence, understanding, knowledge, and wisdom. Edgar Shannon built much of the university we inhabit today. He kept the university students safe during a violent and frightening time on college campuses around the country. He exhibited respect for all persons. He was a true scholar, and he made this a truly public university open to women and others underrepresented in higher education. We can all embrace that legacy. And now I'd like to invite President Ryan to say a few words. Jim. Uh, thank you, John, and welcome to all of you on this beautiful spring day. Um, I'm delighted you could be with us to celebrate this incredibly important milestone. 
So I've had the mixed fortune of having a front row seat to the renovations, um, given that they occurred right across the street uh, from Cars Hill. To be even more precise, the renovations occurred right across the street from my bedroom window. And I often imagine myself as Jefferson from Monticello looking down on the construction of um, UVA. I can personally attest to how hard our design and construction teams have been working. And I can tell you also from personal experience that they began their work quite early and seemed to do a lot of backing up of trucks <laughs> given the telltale beeping that usually began around 5 a.m. To say that I am pleased that the renovations are complete is therefore an understatement. But I confess I could not have imagined that the end result would be so spectacular. I'm particularly struck by the light and airy study spaces that feel so welcoming, the attention paid to sustainability, the new inviting entrances like this one, the meticulous preservation of the Harry Potter room, and the underground connection to Clemens. So first and foremost, thank you to HBRA architects, to Skanska USA, and to all the designers, planners, and builders who have worked alongside Alice Roucher's team and Don Sundgren's team to bring this vision to life. It's also been an honor, as John indicated, to receive such generous support from the Commonwealth of Virginia. And I'd like to echo John in thanking Senator Deeds in particular for his crucial support of this project. We've also benefited from the generosity of donors and friends of the library, and our Board of Visitors have been terrific thought partners and supporters. Former President John Castine has also offered his support, expertise, and genuine affection for the library. These collaborations will bear fruit for the university and the Commonwealth for generations to come. Of course, there's no bigger champion for the library than university librarian John Unsworth. Under his leadership, library staff have worked tirelessly to get us to this point, from moving books and materials both out of and back into the building, to adjusting services and spaces so students and faculty could seamlessly continue their work, even with our largest library close. For this, we owe John and his colleagues our deepest thanks. John, thank you. As all of you know, and as John mentioned, when Jefferson designed the university, he made what was then a radical choice to put the library at the center of grounds rather than a chapel. And to this day, the library li lies at the very heart of UVA. The library underpins and supports the research endeavors of every student and faculty member on grounds. Their work can either be diminished or magnified by the capacity of our library because they depend upon its resources to deepen and enrich their scholarly pursuits. It is not an exaggeration to say that as the library goes, so goes research and scholarship at UVA. But our library is also a public library, and it's an essential part of our commitment to the greater Charlottesville community, meaning that anyone can use the library at any time, and I do mean any time. I remember that even during the January 2022 winter storm, a day that felt an awful lot like today, which caused thousands of power outages, the library remained open, providing access to communications, computers, and even just areas for people to find a warm, safe space. The library is also one of the largest employers of students on grounds, and from what I understand, students love working here. Let me close with a final word of gratitude to the Shannon family members who are here today to join us in dedicating this building in Edgar Shannon's honor. I have to say I have become a great admirer of President Shannon, whose accomplishments and character will be discussed by the speakers who follow me. But let me say I cannot imagine a better person to honor as we dedicate an essentially new library than the person, President Shannon, who ushered in the modern era of this university and whose impact is still felt today. In short and in sum, I believe UVA now has a library that is equal to our aspirations for our third century and beyond, and I'm enormously grateful to all who made it possible. Thank you. Please welcome Senator Cree Deeds. Thank you so much for once, the, the people with the seats and the best seats at this event 
are the seats in the back. And they're not seats. They're people that are standing in the sunshine. So congratulations. Uh, the, the, uh, thank you for the introduction. I, this morning I was with my friends Tim Kane and Ann Holton. And Ann was telling me about her childhood and the trips to the beach and the friendships that you all enjoyed um, and your parents enjoyed. And, and I, I would tell stories, but it's cold. I'm not going to do that. I want, I, I'm just excited to be here today to celebrate the grand opening of this impressive state-of-the-art library. Representing the University of Virginia in the Senate is a distinct honor. Being in the Senate is, is a distinct honor. And as we can all be proud of our robust system of public colleges and universities across the Commonwealth, the best in the country, I think. The, the strength of our system reflects for the Commonwealth's commitment to the development of our next generation of leaders, to the education of our future workforce, and to the creation of environments that foster entrepreneurship and intellectual curiosity. Projects like the new Edgar Shannon Library help ensure that we bring the brightest students here and attract and retain the best faculty, both of which are critical to the mission of this university and to the overall economic health of the region and of the entire Commonwealth. For it's in spaces like this that new companies are going to be envisioned. Creativity is inspired and tomorrow's problems are solved. I know the return on the state's investment of, of this for this project is immeasurable. I would like to end by simply thanking President Ryan, the rec director, the Board of Visitors, the faculty and staff, everyone for their leadership and their creativity. Thank you so much. And please welcome Carlos Brown, Vice Rector of the Board of Visitors. Thank you and good afternoon. Everything's been said, but has been said by everybody, so here's my shot. Um, on behalf of the UVA Board of Visitors, I want to thank you for joining us. And I want to especially thank our, our Rector, Robert Hardy, who's also here, as well as the other members of the board who are in the audience. Uh, I want to start by uh, especially thanking Senator Creed Deeds and the members of the General Assembly. And by saying that this is not your parents' library. <laughs> it is that and much more. Uh, it is filled with light and energy. I walked in and I saw a performing arts group. Uh, that didn't happen when I was here at the library. The library was the place you went to hide from your friends uh, when, who were not being as studious as they could be. Uh, we're no longer scrolling away in remote curls or on the old scary stacks. Uh, which I did when I was a student, but there are fun places both to gather, to get to know each other, but also to do the things that we're here to do, which is to learn and expand knowledge. As President Ryan said, uh, Jefferson saw the library as the main and most significant university building. Uh, as we all know, the Rotunda was the original library. Uh, we now have a space that better represents the intellectual pursuits of the university community and also reflects the, uni the unique beauty of the academic village. So I want to close by thanking the members of the Shannon family. I know you'll hear more about them from those who knew President Shannon well. But on behalf of the board, I want to express our pleasure in recognizing his many achievements through the naming of this new, newly renovated library. So thank you. Uh, next, a man who needs no introduction, Larry Sabato. I haven't been this cold since John F. Kennedy's inauguration. That was back in 1961. But fortunately, Carlos, an old friend of mine, has been so short that he's given me extra time. Uh, you know, traditionally, speakers cut their remarks when the weather is this bad, but I won't do that. Took me a long time to rate these. And also, I love Edgar Shannon, and I, I owe him this. I'm, actually, I'm so cold, I'm almost willing to run with you, Jim. <laughs> Not quite, but almost. How wonderful it is to see Eleanor and Lois and Susan and Virginia back together. And we send out our best wishes to Bess, who unfortunately is in the hospital, but we know she's going to be back up and running very soon. They're so near the special house on Cars Hill where they grew up. Uh, and uh, we're, it's just a happy day for all of us who are family and friends of Edgar Finley Shannon, Jr. How richly he deserves this signal honor. Believe me, he earned it. I remember seeing him during much of that time. 
Along with his magnificent partner in life, Eleanor Bosworth Shannon, Edgar Shannon achieved so much. If you seek his monument, look around you, because many of the facilities and programs we take for granted today were initiated by him. He was president of the University of Virginia in a time of great social turmoil, from civil rights to the women's movement to environmentalism, as well as deep opposition to the Vietnam War, especially among college students, whom I'm representing even though I'm 72. Uh, and that was true in Charlottesville. Edgar Shannon steered us through it all successfully, putting us on the path to full in, uh, integration and complete co-education at a time when those things were actually controversial. That's true, they were. There were many great days in Edgar Shannon's 15-year presidency, but to me, his finest moment will always be in May 1970, after the Vietnam War was widened with the invasion of Cambodia and the subsequent killing of four college students and serious wounding of nine others by the Ohio National Guard at Kent State University during an anti-war protest. Students here and across the nation passionately demanded action. Many universities had to end the semester early. Large-scale demonstrations, just steps from this place, resulted in an overreaction by the state police who arrested hundreds, pulling students out of their fraternity houses and their lawn rooms, and even the pizza delivery guy at Cars Hill was arrested and taken into custody, all stuffed into a Mayflower moving van for transport to the pokey. Edgar Shannon stood up, and at great peril to himself, he said enough. He put his presidency on the line. With thousands of students and faculty gathered on the lawn, Shannon came to the steps of the rotunda, held up a peace candle, gave the peace sign, and read his telegram to our U.S. Senators and President calling for withdrawal from Cambodia and an end to the divisive war in Southeast Asia. It was bold and brave, and those on the lawn roared their approval. Afterwards, some in powerful positions, Cree wasn't around then, not you, Cree. Uh, they were sincere in their own beliefs, but they called for President Shannon's firing. Shannon was prepared whatever came his way because he knew he had done the right thing. Fortunately, as days and weeks passed, many more people began to recognize that President Shannon's decisive actions had cooled sentiments that were bordering on the violent. It's important to stress that the University of Virginia, almost alone among the major East Coast universities, never shut down and finished out the academic year in 1970 because of Edgar Shannon. Now there's an Edgar Shannon lesson for us all. Do the right thing without a safety net. You'll probably face severe criticism, but someday when someone recounts your life, it may be that daring episode that stands out. Personally, as I think of Edgar, I remember a dear friend and role model who taught me many things directly and by example. In conclusion, I want to share one memory with you that I hope will serve as a caution to the students who are gathered here. They've got to be out there someplace. They're up by now, I know that. <laughs> Once, as students, in our righteous indignation, we students marched into Mr. Shannon's office, then located on Pavilion 8 on the lawn. We had a list of non-negotiable demands. That's the way we did it back then. All of them were non-negotiable. And in that case, uh, we, we demanded that O Hill Cafeteria be moved from the site that you know today to another place because too many trees were being sacrificed to build it. Mr. Shannon didn't respond immediately. Instead, he shuffled through stacks of paper for what seemed like forever until he found what he had sought. He read us the minutes of another meeting held five years earlier in which our student predecessors had marched in and demanded that O Hill be, met, be, be built in the precise location to which we were objecting. We quickly excused ourselves and left. <laughs> President Ryan, this example may come in handy for you. For now, we can always be proud of the person this library honors, Edgar Shannon, moved this university to the right side of history. He richly deserves to be remembered here and now, and with the magnificent Shannon Library, he is. All hail to Shannon Library. Thank you, Larry.
Um, next, I'd like to introduce my dear friend and mentor, Professor Emeritus Jerome McGann. I wouldn't be here except for Edgar, um, and, uh, and it's been an incredible 30 years that I've been here. I, I'm here to speak on behalf of the faculty, uh, and I, I think it's the plain truth to say that Edgar Shannon was the university's decisive 20th century leader because he was a great scholar and educator and greatly committed to one of our nation's most serious commitments, public education. How fitting that this Shannon Library should be grounded on the grounds. Now in hindsight, it seems amazing that the Board of Visitors should have chosen him for president in 1959. He had only joined the faculty three years before, and he was an associate professor. Did they foresee the transformations that this 41-year-old man would bring about? He took down the racial barrier. He took down the gender barrier. He turned UVA from a genteel university of higher education to a major research center and model for public university education. The Board of Visitors must have seen something unusual in that young man. 11 years later, when colleges and universities, as Larry was talking about, and the entire nation was being fractured by the terrible events at Kent State, he would deliver a speech that upheld the honor of caring for and respecting the honest differences that are the beloved strengths of a democratic society. Denounced at the time, uh, of the denounced at the time by some of the Commonwealth's most backward-facing journalists and politicians, who called for Shannon's dismissal, the Board of Visitors stood with him and with the community. The speech that he gave is now recognized as the most impressive ever delivered from the steps of the rotunda. As many of you probably know, when he was president and afterwards, he kept up his graduate and undergraduate teaching. And when he left the presidency in 1974, he resumed his most important research project, the addition of the letters of Alfred Tennyson that he undertook with his friend and colleague Cecil Y. Lang, my mentor. Now many of you also know what a decent and cordial man Edgar was. He and Cecil were close friends. Both were devoted teachers and meticulous scholars and both cult cultivated in very different ways an impish sense of humor. But I doubt many of you here know that Tennyson, a great poet, took a dim view of prose and he hated writing letters. His letters are a mine of, Victor of Victorian information. But alas, unlike, say, Byron's letters, they are a bloody ordeal to read. <laughs> Understanding the problem, Edgar and Cecil decided the only way to deal with this problem would be through their own prose, not Tennyson's. Their commentary and their notes are erudite, as any scholar would want them to be, but they are also often, at the same time, brilliantly amusing. Let me treat you to one of them. It was triggered by a letter of March and April 1851 when Tennyson wrote to thank Henry Taylor for sending him some tooth powder. Now that clearly called for a gloss uh, because it happens that Tennyson had a lot of trouble with his teeth. What was Tennyson's tooth powder? Now a scholar who isn't also like a badger, a dogged digger, is just not a serious person. Edgar and Cecil spent several months, I mean it, several months, trying to find out 
the brand of Tennyson's tooth powder. They never did. But they rose to their occasion and delivered the following commentary. This is Tennyson's, this is Tennyson's letter, or I mean uh, the, the gloss on Tennyson's uh, tooth problems. Tennyson's teeth began to trouble him seriously in the 1850s and continued to plague him for 10 years. As a matter of course, he had the best dental care available, being looked after by a dental surgeon, Henry John Barrett of Craigie and Barrett, 42 Finsbury Square, London, who became a friend with whom he dined in London and who accompanied him on a tour to Norway in August 1858. Barrett filled several of his teeth in January 1853, and a month later fitted him with some false teeth. In June 1859, he wrote, Tennyson, my lowlying teeth and another old stump were pulled out yesterday, and two others were cut down, not without pain, but not so much as I expected. And a few years later, he was able to report that my new teeth serve me much better than the old, and Barrett says they are indestructible. Now, a good deal is known about Victorian dentistry, which had moved a long way from the threefold tradesmen of the 18th century when they were, uh, the dentist was, blood letter, tooth drawer, uh, and shaver. Tennyson's carious cavities, that's oh, Edgar, carious cavities were probably filled with gold and gold foil packed in by a spring hammer and his artificial teeth were presumably made of porcelain, though they could have been bone, ivory, or ox teeth, or conceivably natural teeth. Hordes of ghoulish truth drawers, as the Pell-Mell Gazette reported in an article in August 1865, following the battles from Waterloo to the American Civil War, collected the teeth of the slain soldiers, packed them in boxes, and posted them to London, where they commanded very high prices. It is, this is Edgar, it is a transcendental conceit. <laughs> a transcendental conceit. But one can resist surmising that the laureate's substitute teeth might have been extracted from the jaws of death and the mouth of hell. <laughs> now that is one of the glories of a scholar's prose. A learned and very witty reflection on Tennyson's teeth that also manages to tell us a great deal while never answering the original question. <laughs> and how charming to close with that allusion to the charge of the Light Brigade. One of Edgar's most cherished possessions and gifts to this library was Tennyson's autographed manuscript of his celebrated poem. To read that passage now is to realize why a fine man made such a wonderful educator, and why that wonderful educator turned out a steadfast and humane president. To adapt the words of another great poet, who was also a great letter writer, by the way, who spent his life defending inconvenient truths, may President Edgar Shannon and his library long remain a light to lessen ages, shameful journalists, and deplorable politicians. Thank you. And finally, um, Lois Shannon, daughter of Edgar Shannon. Good afternoon, and what a delight to be here with all of you. I'm Lois Shannon, the medal, and I'm speaking on behalf of my sisters, Virginia, Sue, Bess, and Eleanor. Sadly, we're missing Bess who so wanted to be here, but is hospitalized with pneumonia. Our thoughts and prayers are with her and her family today. 
First, we would like to express our deepest gratitude to the Board of Visitors, President Ryan, the Naming and Memorials Committee, and the entire university community for this dedication and acknowledgement. We can imagine no greater honor for our father than for this beautiful library at the heart of the university to be dedicated in his name. We would like to especially recognize John Unsworth for his generosity in keeping us informed during the process, inviting us here today, and for sending us the recording of our father's speech on the steps of the Rotunda in 1970. Listening to his speech was an incredible gift, not only to hear Dad's extraordinary voice again, but to be reminded of who he was and how he raised us. Our father was a disciplined, thoughtful, kind, loving human being. And as in all aspects of his life, he was a teacher. He taught us principles that defined his life and came to guide ours, of which we'd like to name a few. Dad shared his love of language and expression by correcting our grammar and quoting poetry at every occasion. Very unique was not okay. <laughs> and only in adulthood did we realize that his words for hurrying us out the door, let us go then, you and I, were not, <laughs> they were T.S. Eliot's. <laughs> Dad showed us the importance of standing up for what we believe in and the need to work for a better and more just society, even when it's not easy. For example, he believed deeply in public education as the basis for a just society. So we mostly attended public schools and our parents set up a foundation to support public school teachers here in Charlottesville. Dad insisted we leave any place better than how we found it. We still remember the intense mopping and scrubbing we had to do before leaving the cottage at, that we rented each summer at Wrightsville Beach. Dad modeled the importance of loyalty, honesty, and loving kindness in relationship. And nothing said this more loudly than the way he cared for our mother through years of illness, even when he was ill himself. Dad taught us to care about the news, politics, and participating in American democracy. Every night, we watched Walter Cronkite together. And we will never forget our thrill when Walter himself came to stay with us. <laughs> Dad empowered us as women, not only by advocating for women to be admitted to the university and Washington and Lee, but by supporting us in anything that we chose to do. His message was consistently, you can do anything you set your mind to. Dad demonstrated the importance of seeing the value and humanity of all people and building collaborative community, even with those he most vehemently disagreed. We watched him cheer at football games with the board members who had denounced him and greet every person he encountered on his walk from Cars Hill to Pavilion 8. Ahead of his times, Dad understood that admitting mistakes allowed for human connection. As he said on the steps of the rotunda, some mistakes have been made, and I do not exempt myself from them. Mistakes will continue, as we are human, and I am a human being. As a child of the Depression and having fought in World War II, he impressed upon us not only the importance of restraint and saving, but of giving and living life to its fullest. We can still see him strapping on his skis and swooping down the mountainside for that last run of the day. For dad, love was a guiding principle and a necessary driver of unity. As he said on the steps of the rotunda, if it is outraged love and, re and reverence that make us so angry and divided, let us remember that love and reverence can also be the bond 
and must be the bond that brings us together if we are determined to set things right. Wow. What a beautiful world dad and mom modeled for us. And even though they aren't physically here with us today, we feel their presence in this moment, in this place, and in our hearts. Thank you. And now you all deserve to come inside. So come on in, there's a reception and it's warm in there.